quickly, just in case you didn't know what HIV is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you do. Uh, HIV is a virus which we began to notice in the mid 1980s and it's a virus which attacks the immune system and uh, depletes um, the body's ability to fight infection. And a lot of these infections um, uh, are ones that people with who have full immune systems are able to manage themselves are infections that we rarely see in people that have really healthy immune systems. So um, these infections are what are called opportunistic infections. And uh, these are the infections that go on to uh, make people with HIV ill and uh, ultimately, uh, without treatment, kill them. Um, so I was, uh, I'm from the UK, and um, I say that because there's probably a, a good chance that if I wasn't born in the country that I was born in, I'd probably be dead now. Um, so uh, it's really down to geography. You know, I'm still here today in the country that I was, I was born in. Um, and I come from a town about 35 miles north of London. It's a small town. Um, one of the new towns built after the Second World War. So after the Blitz of London, they built these towns outside, which um, were, were built very quickly, lots of concrete, and they're, they're pretty soulless places. Many of them built in the 1950s, but the, these towns are quite small and um, are quite different to the big cities because um, you grow up not thinking that the things that happen in the big cities happen in towns like that. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, if, 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 a, if a girl became pregnant and she was still at school, that was a massive scandal. Um, could possibly make the local newspaper, you know. <laughs> I think about about things today, you know, and, and uh, you know, people wouldn't bat an eyelid at that happening. It's so commonplace. But uh, certainly, HIV wasn't something that um, I thought would happen to me. And I remember we had some adverts on television at the time, a government information program. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, which um, uh, basically consisted of icebergs and tombstones. And you may sometimes hear, particularly people in the UK talk, when they're, they're looking back in the past, mention icebergs and tombstones. And you might think, OK, what do they mean by this? The icebergs and tombstones campaign, uh, yeah, they, they, were, they were pretty scary. And um, they had a big impact on the imagination of people in the country, so much so that they're still spoken about 30 years later. And the iceberg was, was the, the, it was kind of, you could see the tip of the iceberg above the water, but the suggestion was that there was this whole other problem going on underneath. And the tombstones um, uh, were, were, were kind of, uh, well, basically just saying that this thing kills. And so there was a lot of fear around it and we, we didn't really understand um, HIV. Um, certainly the gay community in, in, in the UK were much more aware of it because they were the group that were being predominantly affected by it. And um, so I lived in this small town and um, it wasn't a good place to grow up gay. And so I moved to the big city when I was 17 years old. and. Um, yeah, I didn't have um, what you'd call a happy childhood, and uh, I just really wanted somebody to show me some affection and take care of me, and um, I very often ended up in situations with people that are um, often a lot older than myself, um, really because uh, my self-esteem was so bad, and um, I believe that poor self-esteem is one of the drivers as well behind um, HIV infection because when you don't really care about yourself um, you, you may be prepared to take risks. Combined with the fact that HIV wasn't the kind of thing that happened to a small town boy, it was something that happened to other people, I didn't think it would happen to me. And it would have been one of the first few people, if not the first person, um, that I had sex with that infected me. And about 
three months after I was infected, um, I had this really aggressive rash come up um, on my my torso and my legs, and um, it was very raised, and uh, there was a severe immune response going on, and I felt incredibly ill. And this doesn't happen to everybody. Uh, one in four, so 25% of people go through what's called a zero conversion illness. I was one of those one in four, and I, I had this zero conversion illness, and I ended up in hospital with it. It was that bad. And I remember um, being in the hospital and the doctor asking me several times if I was gay, and I denied it. I said, no, I'm not. And because clearly in his own mind, he was querying HIV. And um, at that time, he, they were unable to do an HIV test without my consent. And so I didn't have a test then. And uh, I got over the... Um, Zero conversion after a few weeks, felt pretty lousy, but I uh, was discharged from hospital and um, went on my merry way. And um, I decided, I was 17 at that time, I decided, uh, ooh, it must have been about a year later, that I wanted to become a nurse. And so uh, I enrolled um, into my nurse training and uh, commenced that at the Westminster Hospital, which is now part of the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, which, funnily enough, is a world leader in, in HIV care and research. Um, so I started my training and lived in the nurse's home and really felt that my life had begun to settle down a bit. I had direction and focus. I was making plans. I was excited about the future. Meanwhile, a lot of my friends were becoming very, very sick, and I went to see um, one of my friends who was in hospital at the time, and he was dying of AIDS. And it was my first experience on an AIDS ward walking in. And thankfully, we don't see anything like that today, but it, it, it really was a very, very pitiful sight. And I was so impressed with this, my friend's strength, but um, I went and had an HIV test and uh, unfortunately uh, my my courage deserted me for a while and I didn't go back immediately to get the results um, but uh, eventually I did and uh, I, when I went into the um, <laughs> the receptionist and said I've come for my, my test results she said well when was it and I explained it was a while back um, she went to this little shelf on the back, the back of the room. There were only a few files on it, but my file was on that shelf. And she actually opened it up in front of me, and I could see positive stamped on it. So that's, I kind of had an inkling of what I was going to be told. Um, thankfully, we've kind of learned a lot over the years, and we, we don't make mistakes like this anymore. But um, I was called in by the doctor. And uh, he told me what I wanted to know, that I was HIV positive. The next thing he said to me was, I'm so sorry, you're so young. And uh, I, was, I was 18 at the time. And yeah, it, it, it was at the time a death sentence. He didn't expect people to, to survive. And indeed, my friends were, were dying around me. And it completely blew my life apart. Um, I ended up having to leave my, my nurse training. Um, at the time, um, there's an uncanny thing that goes on in my life where I, I kind of, uh, seems to be a, a synchronicity of time. I was diagnosed on the same day that Florida dentist David Acker died. And David Acker, you may remember or not, was a guy that infected five or six of his patients intentionally. One of those was a girl called Kimberly Bagalis who appeared on the US show 60 Minutes and it had kind of put into the the American public psyche the fact that healthcare workers could be this major, major risk to them. And so it was a bad day to be diagnosed because all of a sudden a London hospital had a student nurse that was HIV positive. They certainly didn't want anybody to find out about this. Um, if you're not qualified, you're not considered competent to practice. Um, so uh, that was the end of my training. Thankfully, today it's very, very different. There's no problem with being HIV positive and being a healthcare worker. 
But back then, things were very, very different. And we understood things very, very differently. And there was a lot of fear. So my home was attached to my work as a nurse because I lived in the nurse's home. So I lost my home as well as my job and my income. And of course, I had a network of friends there who were also student nurses, and I lost those too. Uh, my family, um, when I told them that I was HIV positive, they'd never been happy with the fact that I was gay, and they'd, they'd often held it up as being, well, you're going to get AIDS. And I was told that I'd made my bed and I had to lie in it. And I haven't had any contact with them since. Um, I lived in a really grossy bedsit. Um, with a mattress on the floor, not much else, um, and uh, it was it was a pretty sad, sorrowful time. And I spent about two years drinking too much, taking drugs, um, really um, doing what a lot of people with HIV did at that time, which was kind of just going on this kind of crazy last party. And, um, yeah, it wasn't a healthy, healthy thing to do and it wasn't a good time, but uh, such was the fear of, of HIV. And in fact, that's probably one of my biggest regrets. I spent my entire 20s living in fear. And these should have been some of the best years of my life. Uh, I'm making up for it now. And, um, uh, yeah, so... Um, a lot of fear, and um, I got to a point where the anger came, I guess, of what had happened to me. I kind of, if you like, and people talk about you, I'm sure you all have heard about the stages of the grieving process. The first one being denial, and the second one being anger. And I, I got angry at what had happened to me at life, at God, or whatever you want to call it. You know, I just, it felt incredibly unfair. And meanwhile, my friends were dying as well. And I thought, we've got to do something about this. I knew I had some friends that were, had become activists. And I got involved in it myself as an activist. And um, there's a difference between activism and advocacy. And I would probably describe myself as an activist advocate now. But back then, it was, it was a bit more hardcore. And... Um, <coughs> I'd done some reading um, about HIV and healthcare workers and realized there wasn't a lot out there about it. And so I decided to write a book, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. One of the things HIV does make you do is it makes you kind of think, okay, what the hell, I might as well go for it. You know, if I'm gonna die, I may as well just see how far I can push it. And uh, almost in the nature of an experiment, and so I signed uh, the contract for my first book, age 23, which was pretty crazy at the time. And it took me three years to write this book. And I put really blood, sweat and tears into it. I worked very, very hard on it. And it's, it was the first academic work that I'd ever done. And um, actually the vice principal of the School of Nursing um, a guy called uh, Professor Robert Pratt, who wrote a strategy, an AIDS strategy for nursing care, um, you know, checked that everything was okay in it and that it was all correct. And um, I, I was working for an organization called the UK Coalition of People Living with HIV and AIDS. I was attending a lot of uh, meetings in the UK, asking very difficult questions. Um, Telling my story, I guess, but the story so far at the time. So it's really nice to do things like this now where I can look back on it in a historical context, because at the time when I was talking about it, it was about the present. It was about then. And uh, so it's, it's nice to talk about things like this in a, in a historical context. But um, I've mentioned before that timing is, is synchronicity. As Jung called it, um, it is something that, that seems to happen an awful lot to me. And as I was finishing the last page of the book, literally, the day that it was going to the publishers, the telephone rang. And it was the hospital. 
and they told me that I needed to go uh, to the hospital straight away because they believed that I may have been infected with a drug resistant strain of tuberculosis. And um, the reason why they thought I might have been infected is because prior to that, for about since 1994, when I had PCP, which is an age related pneumonia, I'd found myself in and out of hospital about once every five, six weeks with a number of uh, opportunistic infections, which my body was struggling to battle. So I was full blown AIDS by this time and uh, 23, 24 years old. And, um, you know, the end was nigh, you know, and, and I knew. And, by all intents and purposes, that, that's what was coming. And um, on one of those occasions while I was in hospital, um, I remember there was a, a, a guy in the bed opposite me and he had a really bad cough. And I remember it because he kept me awake and I wanted to go and throttle him um, or put him out of his misery. And I know that's not a very, very kind thing to do, but when you're not ill, when you're ill yourself and you just want to sleep, and I just have this abiding memory of this cough that he had. And the hospital were curious about what was making him cough as well. So they carried out not one, but three induced sputums. Only they did it on the open ward, which isn't a very, <laughs> isn't a very good idea when the person that you're inducing sputum on, so you're getting them to breathe in vaporized saline to get them to cough to collect samples, has multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And seven people, sorry, eight people were infected in that outbreak, um, of which I'm the only person that survived. And uh, so I finished in the last page of the book, went to the hospital and uh, they admitted me and I found myself in negative pressure isolation for three months, I'm not expected to survive. I was told that if I did survive and I remained infectious, I may never be able to leave the room. Um, and for me, it really did feel like the end. I mean, they... I, Sometimes people used to say to me when they wanted to comfort me um, in the years previous, when I used to talk about the fact that I was so young and that I was going to die, they would say, but any of us could be hit by a bus tomorrow. And I would say, yeah, but the difference is, is I feel like I'm standing in the road. I can see the bus coming and I don't know how fast it's traveling. And that was the big difference. So it felt like the bus was upon me. I was, I was, could see the headlights. I was like a, 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 a scared rabbit. And um, this would have been 1995. And um, whilst I was in hospital, the other seven people died. And it, it, it ended up on the news because of the mode of transmission. It should never happen. There was a bit of a scandal about it. And people started writing letters to me, people that I didn't even know, just, just because they were upset about my predicament, which restored a little of my faith in humanity. But again, it, was, it, it wasn't that that kept me going. It was anger, anger at what had happened to me that I had become infected with MDR-TB um, that I think kept me going. But I wanted to see some kind of justice out of it. And TB treatment isn't very nice, as I'm sure a lot of you already know, but MDR TB treatment really isn't very nice. I was on about 30 tablets a day and three injections a week. And again, I lost everything. I lost my home. I lost my partner. I was unable to go and, and, and work for the organization that I'd been working with before because they were immunocompromised. I was worried I'd infected them. So for a second time, everything was wiped out and I was starting again when I was discharged and I remember uh, when I was admitted in 1995 it was the start of summer and I'd spent the entire summer in this room uh, which was negative pressure you couldn't open the window um, and there was no air conditioning it was a very hot summer I had a fever as well so it was pretty awful and I remember when I was discharged, it was October the 13th, 1995. There was a frost on the ground and all the leaves had come off of the trees. And from the window where I was in my room, I couldn't see any trees. I didn't realize when I went in, the trees were all green, but I hadn't been able to see any out of the window. When I left, the weather had completely changed. All of the leaves were on the, on the pavement, they were brown. 
and and it was a big shock to me but i'm glad to be out of there glad to be out of there and i was put in temporary accommodation and and slowly started rebuilding my life again um around this time i wrote another book called tuberculosis survival handbook again taking a situation that was very very negative that had happened to me and trying to turn it into something useful and that book changed my life really um i published it myself because nobody else wanted to and i went to to my publisher they said no there's no market for a book on tuberculosis that's all over and done with um as did other publishers but i knew different I knew different and from that, that isolating experience and they used to say with AIDS you are not alone with TB you really do feel very very alone and, and it's there's a lot of stigma around HIV but when you have TB as well there's a lot of stigma around that even within the HIV community you then become stigmatized it's very stigmatizing in their eyes so um, again my support network was gone but, but that book um, documented how I survived three years of treatment and I sent a copy of that book to the World Health Organization and got a call from them and uh, started getting active in early TB activism advocacy and um, I did take a five-year break from it a few years ago, but you know I've done it in total for about 15 years or so, so about two decades if you add on the five years. And um, at that time when the book came out in 1998 as well, I'd managed, I don't know how, but I'd managed to scrape through to a time when antiretrovirals came about. And so I'd lived in the dark old times pre-antiretroviral, and then came along these drugs and the doctors really didn't know how effective they were going to be and i think if you told any of those doctors that these drugs were going to be a game changer they would have laughed at you time is the one thing that we can't recreate in a laboratory and started taking these drugs and my my cd4 count i had a cd4 count if any of you know what cd4 counts mean i had a cd4 count of two so it should ideally be around five six hundred it could be possibly up to about 14 1500 but when you get below 200 it's considered an aids diagnosis so my immune system has been completely wiped out i had no immune system so i think another six months uh, i probably wouldn't have made it because you know, I was I was struggling to stay alive. I was very very thin. I was about fifty eight kilograms. You can see I've put on a bit of weight since then, and uh, I was very weak and tired. I very often couldn't hold down food. I had terrible diarrhea. I couldn't leave the house sometimes. Um, and so I started taking these these tablets, and within a few weeks I started to feel a lot lot better I had a lot more energy and the side effects settled down quite quickly there were some side effects initially but they settled down after about six weeks and they weren't major ones and um it was like lazarus coming back from the dead um and this was happening all over the developed world where people were taking this medication and where they actually had dedicated AIDS wards where people went to die the kind of place where I went to see my friend all those years ago and today these wards are closed down but we don't have them anymore we if somebody's ill with HIV it's actually quite rare and we put them on a general ward we don't have the dedicated wards wards for people anymore in the UK and um, and so I had this second chance at life which I wasn't expecting and was completely unpredicted and continued to write and continued in my activism and advocacy and as time went on i got stronger and put on weight and bit by bit my life came back together so having lost lost absolutely everything um 
my life come back together and, and, and here I here I am today. Um, along the way I've, I've experienced a lot of stigma as I said not only from outside the HIV community but also having had TB within the HIV community and but I would say the most harmful thing has been the internalized stigma the way I have felt about myself the way I've perceived myself it's not been other people's reaction to me it's been about the way I feel myself the way I perceive myself and I started to do some work on myself basically if you like personal development challenging some of these core old beliefs I had about myself and I wrote an, a, a, a book about that as well um, second edition of it here HIV happy which basically talks about how to coexist with the virus and you know I live I live I have a really nice life today. Um, and uh, HIV in some ways has opened many doors for me as a as has TB um, and I don't you know some people might be annoyed to hear me say that uh, of course I'd rather never have been HIV positive or have had TB but you work with what you have and you try and turn it into something positive or at least at least I have um, where are we now in terms of HIV? Well, it's very, very different to the way I described 30 years ago. Um, I've spoken to you about the dark old, day, dark, dark old days, a dark era of pre-antiretrovirals, but people diagnosed with HIV today have a, you know, a very, very different future mapped out for them because that path has already been trodden for them. We know exactly what to do. People taking HIV treatment will remain well. They will live normal lifespans. Most importantly, they're non-infectious. People who take antiretrovirals are non-infectious. And so something interesting has happened now in that the main driver of HIV infections globally isn't from people that we know to be HIV positive, certainly not those on treatment. It's the people that have never been tested, or the great untested, as we call them. So there's been this complete turnaround where actually it's people that have never tested or haven't had a test for a long time that potentially present the most risk. And that is because if they're not taking antiretrovirals, they don't have an undetectable viral load. So that basically, we, we call it um, undetectable equals uninfectious. Um, so the drugs stop the replication cycle of the virus the immune system gets back on top of it there isn't there's so minuscule amount of HIV there there isn't potential to infect in anybody if you're not on treatment then the virus just replicates 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 you end up with a high amount of virus and your infectivity is a lot higher which is why we need to encourage people to test and there are a lot of benefits to knowing your HIV status. And the first one is that the sooner you get on treatment, and as I said, the, the side effects are minimal or none at all, um, the more of your immune system that you save. I mentioned before that I had a CD4 count of two. I still have a low CD4 count because the kind of treatment I was on was called salvage therapy. They were trying to save what was left of my immune system and over time, my immune system has built back up, but it will be it will never be the level that it was was before. But thankfully, what I do have works well enough for me. If people don't get tested, their immune system is 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 eventually fails, then it becomes more difficult to kind of pull those people back to salvage them. And unfortunately, there are many people who are, don't know they're HIV positive, and the first that they actually learn of it is they are presenting to casualty with a chest infection which turns out to be PCP and AIDS related pneumonia or all of these old things infections that we just don't see anymore that's their presenting infection it's an AIDS diagnosis and very often for those people it's too late god forbid it's tuberculosis as well that they may have because the two together are actually quite difficult and challenging to treat. Some people have called having the two together the devil's alliance and in some of the countries of the world that we work as an organisation 
the two together kind of are very, very commonplace. So it's really important to um, know your HIV status. Everybody should know their HIV status. And just because you're, uh, you diagnose a, a negative one year doesn't mean to say that you never do it again. You know, you should probably just have it as part of your annual health MOT. Um, in the UK, we're beginning to normalise this and it's something that certainly among pregnant women women we do routinely and more and more people are coming out as HIV positive some of you might be aware that yesterday uh, one of our MPs um, <laughs> that will be him now go away um, one of our MPs in the UK stood up in the House of Commons um, and told everybody uh, that he is HIV positive and has been for 10 years. Yesterday, yesterday, yesterday he did this. So I wasn't expecting this. I was reading about it on the news yesterday. And of course, it's been really good in the UK because it's showing people that actually you can live a normal, healthy life. He has a partner who's, you know, I've had partners who are HIV negative. In fact, the two loves of my life were HIV negative when I met them, and they still are now. Um, there's no issue with somebody who's HIV positive and on treatment. We call this treatment as prevention. Um, having unprotected sex with somebody who doesn't in terms of HIV. We move into an area here which is controversial in so much as there are I've mentioned treatment as prevention but there are also drugs that you can take called PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis which can prevent you from contracting the virus as well though we don't know whether that's 100% or not it offers a good deal of protection um, but of course it doesn't protect you against all the other things that are out there so, you know, I, I think there is very much certainly among the gay community condom fatigue, you know, people are kind of weary of using them and actually these drugs have come along and it's presenting um, uh, new challenges because people are thinking maybe that they don't have to use condoms anymore. But we're seeing an increase in infections, for example, syphilis, which pre-exposure prophylaxis won't prevent. So certainly within within uh, relationships, they're, they're great. And certainly pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis for people that may be at higher risk of contracting HIV are great. But, um, you know, we need to keep an eye on the ball and make sure that other sexually transmitted infections don't spiral out of control. It's, it's very expensive. Uh, what, the treatment? Yeah. PrEP, yes, it is expensive. So in some countries, um, they do give it out. In, other, in, in the UK, I know that there are some trials going on, but it hasn't been widely distributed. There are, are campaigns to do that. And actually, although expensive in the short term, the long term cost means that we're not having to treat people with HIV and we're not creating new infections. So the pool of infectivity will grow smaller. We have the tools to tackle HIV. We have them now. Uh, we don't have a cure. We don't have a cure, but we have the tools to manage it. And certainly if you have HIV, it's a completely different story. Completely different story to um, to how it used to be. I guess the challenges that we face now, I mean, when I go to my doctor, I get moaned at I smoke. I get moaned at about smoking. I get moaned at about my cholesterol. I get <laughs> I get moaned at, you know, about uh, my diet and lack of exercise. And these are things that a doctor wouldn't have talk, spoken to me about before. He would have basically said, I don't have any drugs I can prescribe you, so what do you want? And you go, Valium, Tamazepam, anything to knock you out, really. And he'd give them to you because he had nothing else to give to you. Um, now, um, it's about keeping people as healthy for as long as possible. And I get moaned at about exactly the same things as everybody else. Um, just realizing that I was going to survive um, with HIV, 
uh, being run over by a bus, uh, allow, you know, allowing for that, that might happen. But um, that, that actually, having spent my entire 20s preparing to die, and then doctors saying, actually, if you take these, you could live to a ripe old age, um, was almost as much of a shock for me as as being told I was HIV positive because it was a future that I hadn't planned for. I've never had a pension and never paid into one. I didn't see the point. Um, I thought that I wouldn't have to bury my parents. I thought that um, yeah, I'll never up, end up in an old people's home. I'll never. You find all of these things that um, uh, that you, you think, oh, well, at least I won't have to deal with those things. And then now all of a sudden I'm, I'm kind of faced with a future that I just didn't think that I'd have. And it's challenging. In fact, when the drug started working for some people, some people with HIV actually killed themselves because they couldn't cope with the idea. They got so used to the position that they were in to be told, well, you might live another 30, 40 years. It was, it was just too much for them. Um, and so there, there has been a period of change, certainly for the long term diagnosed. But as I've said, people that are newly diagnosed, that's a well well trodden path. So as well as the other health challenges of being moaned out about cholesterol and everything else, smoking, whatever, um, I guess the biggest challenges we're going to have now are HIV and ageing, and that we have an ageing population. We are the first generation of people ageing with HIV where we have a, a treatment um, to manage the course of the infection. And we there is evidence to suggest that people on treatment are going to face some additional challenges, may face some additional challenges, for example, um, in their bone density, problems with their joints, maybe problems with their uh, cardio problems. And we're learning more about this as we, as we go along. In, in fact, you know, it's like I said earlier on, um, you can't recreate time in a laboratory. And so we're learning, we're, we're learning all of this stuff now. And there's, there's a lot of work beginning to develop on this front around um, HIV and ageing and keep, keeping people as, as healthy for as long as possible. That's all the physical stuff. Let's put the physical so stuff aside. Um, what I'm really interested in, in, in is people's emotional well-being, people's, the way they perceive themselves, um, the internalised stigma, actually living a happy life because it is entirely possible and I and many other people do it. Um, there was a time when um, HIV was the first thing I thought about in the morning when I woke up and the last thing I thought about at night when I went to sleep and it was it was always it was never far away. Very often now I forget that I'm HIV positive. I take two tablets in the morning and it's so routine for me I don't really kind of think about what I'm taking them for. It's just not that high on my priority list anymore and it's not the first thing I think about anymore the last thing at night so you know I would say to anybody who um, fear anybody who is frightened don't be um, this is a very very different story now and in, in some ways treatment has moved quicker than our um, our understanding of HIV. In fact, it's moved a lot quicker and we haven't kept up in terms of our perception of what it is to be HIV positive. Um, I'll finish on this. They used to say many, many years ago, it was an act up saying that ignorance equals death. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, ignorance still does equal death, but it, in a slightly different way. Ignorance equals death back then was about safer sex and prevention and an understanding how the disease was transmitted. Ignorance today is not knowing your HIV status. Ignorance equals death today because if you have HIV and you don't know your status and you're not on treatment, there's only one way that will go and it's not a good way. So um, that's the reason why we should encourage everybody to get tested.